I think we do have yes. Salvatore back with us here. Oh, uh, I hope so. Um, can you hear sure me? Sure do. Time? We can oh, hear you. Yeah. We got you close thanks. here. Well, thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, obviously, there are so many things we could say about climate change. One of the things I think is more most significant to talk about is it appears that we are not on track to keep global warming below one and a half degrees Celsius by the end of this century, which is obviously pretty bad. I mean, that was the the sort of almost worst case scenario type of goal. So could you just explain where we are in that trajectory and what it would mean for humanity to uh, – you know, breach that threshold. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on, and it's an honor to be uh, in your um, company. I'd like to emphasize that um, what is might not be mentioned in the report is that climate change has been happening for decades, and already hundreds of thousands, if not several million people, have had their lives ruined or have uh, had have, have lost their lives, mainly in regions within Africa or the Pacific Ocean, <clears throat> because of uh, underdevelopment. Uh, directly tied to basically neo-colonial policies, especially from former colonial powers and U.S. governments, and also because of local rulers' misleadership and alliance with uh, foreign investors and the like. But in many regions, warming has already surpassed 1.5 degrees Celsius above um, pre-industrial levels. More than a fifth of all people live in regions that have already seen warming greater than uh, one and a half degrees Celsius in at least one season. Hazards related to climate change um, tend to be higher at lower latitudes in the tropics and especially for the disadvantaged or marginalized communities. But to turn to the question about the, you know, why 1.5 degrees Celsius is so important, um, if at all, is because it's um, limiting that average warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius would reduce, uh, according to projections, the number of people frequently exposed to extreme heat waves. And today in Delhi, um, there's been a horrific scene at 45 degrees Celsius and just an emergency situation. But it would reduce the, the uh, number of uh, people frequently exposed to extreme uh, heat waves by about 420 million, with about 65 million fewer people exposed to exceptional heat waves, like the one I just described about Delhi in India. And disadvantaged and vulnerable populations, some indigenous peoples and communities with livelihoods based on agriculture or coastal resources will be at their highest risk. Um, Regions at the highest risk include Arctic ecosystems. Of course, a lot of indigenous people also live in uh, within those uh, regions, dry island regions, small island countries, the least powerful countries, basically. So limiting warming to one and a half degrees Celsius could reduce the number of people susceptible to climate-related hazards by as much as seven or several hundred million by 2050. Um, and that's some number that we might want to kind of recall later on. But in any case, most land regions... Uh, we'll see more hot days, especially in the tropics, and at one and a half degrees Celsius warming, about 14% of the Earth's population would be exposed to severe heat waves at least once every five years. While if we were to get to two degrees warming, that number jumps to 37%. And extreme heat waves will become widespread at um, 1.5 degrees Celsius warming as well. And, and above that, twice as many megacities as today are likely to become heat stress, potentially exposing 350 million more people by 2050. And um, so, I'm, for those who are interested, I'm just making heavy use here of a report from NASA uh, relying on the uh, intergovernmental um, panel on climate change. But I, I really would like to stress that it needs to be understood that climate change refers to an average of the entire planet. So, that means that some parts are getting very warm and other parts of the planet may even be cooling. Uh, there are very few of those places, but it's an average. So there's no single 1.5 degree warmer world. The impacts of climate change are not spread evenly around the planet and they will not be in future. And temperatures increase at different speeds in different places, with warming generally higher over land areas than oceans. And the strongest warming has been happening anyway already in the Arctic during its seasons. And at mid-latitudes, um, such as where we are, during the warm season. You know, to, to reinforce what you're saying here, there was this study published in Nature Sustainability that found that 2 billion people are at risk of extreme heat, as you were describing it, by the end of this century. 
um, due to this warming. And it, it actually specifies that this, this is basically a third of humanity we're talking about, but almost entirely located in the global south, uh, mostly in India, Nigeria, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Pakistan. Can you explain why this matters? And more importantly, I mean, the inequality of it all, because obviously the entire world is affected by the ramifications of this kind of global warming, but there's a particular portion of the world that's most impacted. Yes, absolutely. It's a sordid uh, situation. And um, it's really, one could even think about it as a global um, scale environmental racism issue. I mean, those are countries with some of the highest, if not the highest number of people in the world. And they have also extreme inequalities, which means that the possibility of a lot more people dying from the impacts of climate change than would be the case in the wealthiest countries is the case. And this is due to lack of access to healthcare, lack of home cooling technologies, insufficient urban green space, among other things, to help reduce temperatures, especially in poorer neighborhoods, and many other forms of inequalities that already lead to lower lifespans. So tearing through the 1.5 degree boundary will just exacerbate all the all those problems that already exist unless, among other international and national policies, there is something like, I mean, I could just name a few things, I suppose, like free technology transfers between countries, the abolition of patenting for life-saving and ecologically sustainable technologies, mass wealth redistribution within those countries that we, uh, you just named, and sensible urban planning that includes all urban dwellers within uh, those affected countries. So that likely means that there have to be, uh, to be blunt, um, governments that are of the socialist variety take it over to accomplish all those um, things because uh, it's obvious, or it should be obvious, I think, it, uh, that businesses and capitalism-friendly governments have demonstrated over and over again to be inept, even at delivering on the basics for the majority of people in their respective countries. That's, those are some of the issues that I'd like to raise on this. No, I think that's a critically you know, important issue, and I know that you were also a guest editor along with my, my good friend David Schwartzman of a recent issue of Science and Society on exactly this issue of the eco-socialist response. And I mean, just expand on that a little bit more because I think this is an important aspect of how where people are conceiving of a new world because there's so much doom and gloom, and it seems like such a daunting problem that, to borrow another phrase, it feels like it can only really be thought of in a productive way you know, by looking at system change um, as opposed to just you know small you know, buy 10 more EVs or whatever. Yes, quite. I mean, I wouldn't want to discount all the initiatives from below that have been happening for many decades, if not um, at least uh, more than half a century. Um, and um, and those are also important. It's just that they're, they're often very disconnected and, and, and they are, uh, let's say, politically naive. But um, because, you know, the 1.5 degree temperature rise has already been surpassed in several regions of the world, and this is something that's not taken up really as, as it should be in that report. It's now even an even more urgent matter to uh, mitigate and uh, to do mitigation by combining reductions in greenhouse gas emissions with tried and tested techniques, in industrial production, farming, all other economic sectors that help absorb uh, greenhouse gases aside from um, reducing the release into the air. So uh, one of the issues as well, and, and this is something that with uh, with David, David Schwartzman, uh, we've, uh, we've been trying to address is that uh, nuclear power is not really very helpful. Time is too short and the uh, um, many other kinds of environmental problems that nuclear power is associated with is just too much of a risk. And it, it's already well known that it's uh, that, that it causes other sorts of problems, particularly in dry lands, if you can imagine, like the amounts of water that is necessary to run those uh, nuclear plants. You know, that's not that's not sensible. In any case, you know, there's so much rubbish diversions like so-called clean coal and nature-based solutions. So, so all these, all the existing techniques and technologies that are proven to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or to absorb greenhouse gases in ecologically sustainable ways need to be prioritized. And uh, like, for example, combining solar energy with what um, most low-input farming communities already know how to do and in combination with ag agroecological science. So there are solutions out there. There are also been uh, put into practice the Movimento uh, de Trabalhadores Sem Terra, the MST, and Cuba have been showing the way forward in this for quite a while, for example, and also the People's Republic of China in terms of investing in solar and other alternative energy systems. Although, you know, you might critique uh, some as aspects of those policies, but still, they're, they're showing also the way forward in many ways. And all these kinds of change has to happen along, you know, it's not just not a, a technical 
um, problem that one can resolve. It's a political problem, just like you were saying, it's about systemic change. And, um, and you know, some, something that would already help would be cancelling national debts, for example. Getting mm -hmm. tax evaders who include some of the most powerful corporations and government people around the world. Cutting military budgets, especially the US military budget, with, you know, top greenhouse gas emitter itself. And much else needs to be done that helps gather the massive amounts of funds and wealth that everyone in the world generates every year. You can put those funds into socially useful ends, like building the capacities of the most affected, of the marginalized communities, so that they can have the infrastructure they need to have more urban green space, so access to the highest quality healthcare, to be able to grow drought resistant crops, for example, and much else, so that they can engage in this um, capacity building to mitigate the effects of already existing climate change impacts. So it's still possible to mitigate and even to do it to some extent with uh, not exactly revolutionary policies, you know, um, and at least by the year 2100, um, when it comes to the more disastrous conditions for the countries like India and Pakistan, Nigeria that um, you um, had uh, alluded to earlier. But none of this can happen without well-coordinated mass mobilizations worldwide, especially the wealthiest and also the most populated countries like um, India. And in India, in any case, interestingly enough, it has been shown that it can be done, this mass mobilization, like the largest strike in human history, if I recall correctly, in 2020. Uh, that also is something that can show us the way. Um, and if the ruling class of the world engage in repression for all that, then there's a little alternative but kicking them out of power. But, of course, uh, that, uh, that is something that hopefully can be avoided. Um, and that's something that people should also uh, be prepared for especially these days when NATO powers seem in trend of starting a nuclear war and, you know, with all that they're pushing for. So there's a lot, that, especially in the NATO countries, that needs to be done with urgency uh, to get rid of these governments and have some sensible policy uh, that can create the conditions to actually uh, bring about mitigation measures worldwide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to raise one last thing before we wrap here, and that is, you know, on the domestic front in the U.S., uh, it was reported recently that there's this deal between Arizona, California, and Nevada that was agreed to to basically take less water from the Colorado River, which has apparently been depleted and, like, suffering from potential collapse by a mega drought and then, of course, decades of overuse. Um, and I think this points to a couple of things that you were mentioning, because this is something that, that was overseen by the Biden administration. So it shows that, that that on some level you can have a sort of like you can have government intervention to do something decent and doable, um, which I think is what makes this deal important. But so in that sense, what does this mean about the power of the state? Right. Like could it, it shows that the Biden administration and many other governments around the world could be doing much more to help mitigate the worst impacts of climate change. It's just a matter of what they choose to do. Mm. Oh, it's so true. And, and these are such excellent points that along the other ones you've already raised, uh, both of you. Um, I mean, this deal, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not exactly well versed in uh, history of U.S. policies and things of that nature, but um, I must say that, it seems to me that it's an important deal because it shows that reducing water use is possible, uh, but only by means of state intervention um, in some respects. So that already belies you know, a lot of the nonsense with respect to like, privatization. Um, so in itself, that could be a major, um, I guess, official acknowledgement that businesses and business-friendly policies lead to disastrous mismanagement of water supplies. Um, and that has anyway been the case for at least 100 years in the Colorado River region for uh, whatever I recollect from reading about that history, which was quite a while ago, reading about that. But, I mean, there are a lot of farming businesses. That's where a lot of the water goes, and it actually, is to you know, the large, um, very, very large uh, farming uh, business sector. Um, of course, the, the extremely large farms, you know, uh, mining operations, ranching, real estate interests already are, are also behind that. So, I mean, it's in their interest to conserve water supplies. Um, so that raises other issues, but um, but it's been, you know, uh, at least 100 years of, uh, of those interests blocking a sensible way of using water uh, and blocking any long-term effective water conservation measures until massive droughts make it more obvious, unworkable and unreasonable their demands for profits are when it comes to water supplies. But, you know, as I was trying to allude to just, if, just a little bit uh, ago, just there's more to this that needs to be worried about, I think, and I sense from reading that report, 
which I um, I had to glance through. Uh, but I, I think that what they're missing and what seems to be missing in the discussion so far, maybe I, I'm probably missing something anyway, but it's that... Um, it's that you know. It, there's a there's a rather a terrible history uh, that is being kind of buried by by, the, by what is being announced, or the way in which it's being announced. Um, it's the fact that the Colorado River is controlled by a settler colonial state, and they have effectively taken have taken away most indigenous communities' access to water, and many of those indigenous communities, like the Utah, the Utah or the Navajo, or any others, maybe at least thirty, um, have at least recognized by the state of the, uh, by the U.S. federal um, system. Um, to this day, uh, a lot of them even lack pipe water in their homes. So, I mean, this is already a disaster, even before this announcement, or even before this, uh, this um, I guess, um, attempt, because it's not certain whether it's going to be uh, put into practice, an attempt, you know, to conserve water supply. But, this kind of environmental racism really got intensified, especially with the 1922 Colorado River Compact, which was about dividing water access among the states of Arizona, California, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, and Wyoming. And that really meant and still means to the benefit of uh, especially the large, mainly white business owners of the day and today, and at the expense of most indigenous communities and millions of Mexicans downstream across the border. So this is one of the huge issues that seems to be being, being ignored. At the moment, uh, I haven't seen any any discussion about these aspects, the, the longer term uh, lack of access of many communities. And another one is is about well, how the water will be distributed and according to what criteria. It's something that I would think uh, will have to be uh, taken up. I mean, for example, how will landless farm workers in the region see any benefit to this agreement of drawing less water? What impact would that new policy have on people living across the border in the uh, states of Baja California and Sonora in Mexico. So there are class, settler colonialism, environmental racism issues that should be brought out in the open about this new policy, and I hope they will be. Mm -hmm. Salvatore Ingo de Moro, Chair of the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at SUNY New Paltz, thank you so much for joining us here on The Freedom Side. Thank you so much. Take care.